the book of Isaiah very quickly. And I give honor to all of our precious guests who are here today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to read the word of the Lord just as it's written today. And I would ask you to bear with me as I do that. And I would ask you to soberly consider what the Lord is saying today. Neither let the son of the stranger, Isaiah 56 and 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name that is better than of sons and of daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love his, the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring unto my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcast of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him, beside those that are gathered unto him. I want you to pay very close attention to verse 5. Even unto them, strangers and eunuchs, that had no ability to reproduce, their own natural seed. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my wall a place. Would you say that with me? A place and a name. A place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant even them will I bring to my holy mountain and I'll make them joyful in my house A prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for my house shall be called in house a prayer for who? For who? All nations, all tribes, all kindreds, all cultures. Jesus Christ died for the entire world. Why did God come to earth to be a sacrificial lamb? To give his entire life and breath. It is so that he could make a place for you. In his house, a prayer. Notice the term was joyful in the house of prayer. You who have had no ability 
to reproduce spiritually. I'm going to make you a place. You that are strangers and outcast, people that may not even know what Christianity really is. He said, I will make a place for you and I won't only place you in my kingdom. I'm going to make you joyful in my house. A prayer. Why would he talk about a place and prayer? And why would you be joyful to pray in his place? Because he said, I will receive every offering. I will hear every word. In the Old Testament, Solomon prayed a prayer. If Israel goes away because of sin and they return, will you hear them in this place? If you bring judgment upon the earth because of sin, will you hear them in this place? And God emphatically had already made up his mind. If you return, I'll hear you. But not only will I hear I have covenant promise that I will answer your prayer. I will give you from that place of repentance everything you need to live for me. I want to talk and preach today if God would help me on joyful in the house of prayer. Would you lift your hands and ask God to help us? God, I thank you for your amazing word. You are mighty and holy, wonderful and true. God, I thank you for reaching for those who have been unfruitful, those who have had no ability to produce anything other than a sinful life. I thank you for touching the stranger and calling their name today. I thank you for giving a place and a covenant of a future promise to bless them and to help them in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it today. Would you lift your hands and give God honor and praise as we approach his throne room of possibility and potential. Father, we thank you today for your amazing grace. Your word is already anointed and powerful. Now give us ears to hear what the word is declaring now. Let us receive it and let it find a fruitful place. Let it find a a healing ground. In Jesus' name, a receptive ground, a fertile ground. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. God bless you and you may be seated. There are many times in life People were cheated out of opportunities simply because they did not have the right name. They were not born into the right family. They did not have the right pedigree. But Jesus made it very clear when he began his earthly ministry that he was coming to seek and to save that which is lost. In the New Testament, we find out immediately that God would not only come for the Jews, but he would also come for the Gentiles. And that every nation, every kindred, and every tongue would have an opportunity, if they would hear his word and be obedient to his word, they would be granted the covenant provision that his word would produce. The reason Jesus came to earth, and I repeat on purpose, is because he was given humanity a place. He left the place of the heavenly so that sinners like me and you would be granted a seat in his kingdom where we would be able to have an unlimited access to come into the throne room of his grace and his mercy and his majesty. I was so honored and humbled this morning to find him waiting for me in a place of prayer. I was able to talk to him from the deep of my heart. 
I was asking him things like, God, would you give me the message that people need to hear this morning? They're not coming just to hear me. If they only hear my words, then not much can happen with just my words. I am just a man. I have a calling. But Jesus, I am asking you to give me a word that will penetrate down in the deep of their heart. Because I don't have the ability to change minds, really. I don't have the ability to change hearts. I don't have the ability to take an Adamic nature and give people a desire to want to be new and to want to change. I can't deliver drug addicts from drug addiction. I cannot say possibly a word that could make the prostitute no longer desire to prostitute her body. I am just a man. I didn't die for anybody. I didn't come to earth. I'm not God. All I am is a preacher and I'm a spokesman. But I do know this, Lord, there will be people there that are hurting and there will be people there that have great knowledge of you and then there will be people there that have not really ever even heard of your name before. And I'm asking for a word that will penetrate. I'm asking for a word that will move deep into the hearts of your people and people who may not know you. People that if you don't touch their life could be over in a flash. If not over in a flash, at least wasted years. Years of scars that God, you never intended for them to have. Pain that you never desired that they should process through. You never meant for them to have the hardships and the difficulties and the scars that their life and their choices have produced. You want to get peace. So it's important, Lord, that we hear your voice, that we come into your presence, that there is a word from you to every heart and every mind and every spirit. That's how preachers pray. If you don't anoint me, Lord, then nothing really will happen. I need your spirit. I need your anointing. I need your power. I need your voice to speak through us and to us. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in a temple that is made with hands. But God doesn't only want to dwell in temples that are made with hands. Ye are the temple of God. And God wants to dwell in your temple. He wants to rule and reign in your life. He wants you to love him and serve him and go into covenant with him. He does not want to keep you in a prison cell. Can I preach to somebody today that the only reason why Christianity seems to be a prison to you is because you do not desire to live the laws of Christianity. And so you feel ensnared, you feel imprisoned, you don't feel free because the laws of Christianity seem to you to be imprisoning, only to find out if you leave God, you leave his church, you leave those very principles and foundation of Christianity, you find out that they're really protections. They are not liabilities. They are not there to imprison you and to destroy you and to cheat you out of life, but they are actually there to protect you and to keep you in the palm of his hand. It is to to keep and to limit the scarring of Satan's ability to literally wreck your life. I may seem a little old-fashioned today, but I'm feeling the spirit of Almighty God. The world and the devil is out to literally maim and kill and destroy your life. But Jesus Christ has come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He is full of mercy, full of grace. 
He is no respecter of persons. He died for every nation. He died for every culture. He died for every individual under the sound of my voice. And he did not wait for you to get right to come unto him. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He gave us an opportunity to be joined into his kingdom. And then he let people know in the Old Testament through the prophets that if you'll pray, I will answer you. If you'll call to me, I I will hear your voice. He wanted, now listen, I realize that there are, there is uh, anthropomorphisms in scripture. I realize that the God that we serve is a spirit. He doesn't have hands as we know it. He doesn't have eyes as we see it, but they are anthropomorphisms letting us know that God can see as we know seeing, that God can hear as we know hearing, that God can feel as we have emotions and we feel that God is able to do that. So he wrote so that humanity will know I am not a God so far off that I can't understand what you're going through. And so he spoke in language so that humanity could know I can hear you. I can see you. I love you. I care about you. I desire you. God wanted people to know I'll be your hands. I'll be your feet. I'll be your protector. I'll be your provider. I'll be everything you need. And it will begin with making a place for for you. I will make a place for you. I will allow you to sit where I sit. I will allow you to enjoy my presence. I will uh, allow you to enjoy my name. I will give you my name. I will go into covenant with you. I will make promises and provision to you. And it's not because you were born right. It's not because you had the right name. It's not because your mama had money or your daddy had money. It's not because of who you are and your intelligence level. It's because I'm God and I'm merciful and I desire humanity to come into covenant with me. I want to hold you. I want to love you. I want to desire you. I desire you to be in my presence. I want you in my everlasting arms. I want to teach you things you don't know yet. I want to, I want to give you things that you never dreamed and if Satan has taken your life away and your joy away and your peace away, I will give it back to you. I, I, I have called you. I have chosen you. I wish you would turn to somebody, look them in the eyes and say, God has chosen you. God has chosen you. God has chosen you. You are selected. You are not a no name brand. You're not just somebody. You're Desiree. You, you've got a name and God allowed the names of humanity to be etched in the palm of his hand. He said, I'm going to die for you. And I may not remember your name. I may not be able to remember everything uh, about you. But God said, I am going to etch prophetically the name of every soul in the palm of my hand. And when I go to Calvary and that blood begins to flow out of my hand, I will remember your name. I will remember that I'm making a place for you that where you can dwell. You don't have to die a sinner. You don't have to die lost. You don't have to die broke and undone. I will supply your every need according to my riches and glory. I'm going to make sure that you have a place. And so in our text, he made sure that the strangers had a place. He made sure that the eunuchs had a place. He made sure that everyone, not only his own chosen people, he said, I am going to grant you access. He said, I don't want the eunuchs nor the strangers to ever say he has separated us because of our condition. He has separated us because of who we are. He has separated us because we wasn't born right. He has separated us because we were raised not with riches. He has separated with us. And when Jesus moved from 
God in the Old Testament to Jesus in the New, the same one true and living God. When he came, people were upset and angry because he was with, was sinners and people didn't understand. Sinners is my motivating force. The whole don't need a physician. I'm not coming for people that are not sick. I'm not coming for people that have it all together. I'm coming for broken humanity. I'm coming for backslid humanity. I'm coming for sinners. And he ate with sinners. And he walked with sinners. And he gave sinners a place. And I wonder if we have become so righteous that we would be like Simon. And Jesus would have to say, Simon, I have somewhat to say against you. Because you don't understand that this sinner woman who is now worshiping me is the very reason I came to earth in the first place. You don't even know what spirit you're of. Is it true that we can get so far removed from the ditch from whence we were dug that we forget how dirty and how nasty we were and how unclean we were and how in uh, in much of a need of a savior that we have. And I don't care if you were raised in the church, we wasn't that clean. We're not that holy. We still needed a savior. Just because you've been raised in the church doesn't mean that you've been the church. And God made a place for every one of us. He wanted sinful humanity to know, I'm making a place for you. And it began in our text. He wanted them to know, you're not ever going to be able to say that I treated you any different than my own. He said, I'm making a place for strangers. And I'm going to make a place for eunuchs. I'm going, and I'm going to give you something that is better than... The lack of ability that you have to produce one of your own sons or daughters. He said, I'm going to grant you access to the kingdom of God. And I'm going to give you a name. And I'm going to give you a place that is going to be better than sons or daughters. Can I tell you today, the fact that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life is the greatest opportunity. It is the greatest thing, the the opportunity to be able to say that God, after all I've done, and after all I did, and after all the places I went, you mean God is still willing to give me a place? Let's talk about some of those places for a minute. minute. Places of perversion, places of drunkenness, places of reviling, places of murder. Oh, when I first got in the church, I heard the testimony of a man on the front row. I murdered a man. It made the pages, the pages of the newspaper. But I was dancing in the spirit on Sunday mornings and Sunday night by a man who had murdered an individual. And the whole city knew it. Everybody knew of the reputation, but nobody talked about it because the prophet was right. When God saves you, people don't talk about who you were. They talk about what God has done in you. And people would rather celebrate the testimony than the tragedy. Can I tell you today that God is in this place and it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done, that God has sent me today to tell you he still has a place for you in his kingdom. You are special to him. He is holy, yes. He is righteous, yes. You're not but he still has a place for you. I've not been able to reproduce what he has wanted me to produce. I have not been what I have needed to be, but he has not given you a writ of divorcement. He is offering it to you through the preacher. Now, if you continue to sin, get ready. Your sins will find you out. But I am telling you, If you understand the magnitude of what God is offering you today, he is saying, I'm not going to give you a past. I'm not going to hold you responsible for your past. I'm going to give you a future that you don't even deserve. And so I told you last week, 
Grace, his grace ought to make us want to serve him more. It it ought to make us want to be deliberate about loving him more. The fact that he is offering me everything and I can't offer him nothing. Uh, God spoke very emphatic last week and said, I'm going to breathe into your brokenness. And what he was saying is, if you allow me and you allow me to grant you the place and you come and sit with me in heavenly places, I will prophetically heal your mind. I will heal your spirit. I will breathe into your brokenness. I will take your wound away. I will heal over the scar. I, I, I had a young man ask me one day who had repetitively sinned over and over again and his life was scarred. He asked me out on the back porch, Brother Scoggins, I have one question for you. Can God heal scars? I said, look up. He created the stars in the heaven. He created every one of them and he knows every one of them by name put my my hand upon my head and grab my hair. I said, every one of my hairs are numbered and God knows the number. Every one of your hairs on your head are numbered. God knows every one of them. And if God can create the entire world that we walk in and breathe in and live in and can do it in six days, you better believe he can heal scars. He can make it as though you didn't have the past. He can make it as though you had never been addicted. He can make it as as though you never messed up. You never made the mistake. God's not here to, to judge your past. He's here to grant you a place and a future in him. Well, why are you screaming it out? Because every devil in hell is screaming loud internally to you and saying God doesn't love you anymore and God doesn't care about you. And I'm going to get a little louder than that internal voice. I'm raising a passionate plea and voice to you that says God loves you more than he's ever loved you before. And every demon and your own self-condemnation, I take dominion over it. And I'm telling you, if God loves you, you need to let him love you. And you need to love yourself and say, I will receive what God is offering me today. I'm going to find my place. Every devil in hell is trying to destroy humanity. One soul at a time, take them out. Take our children, take our babies. Take our loved ones, take our marriages, take our homes. Puke all kind of false doctrine into you that God doesn't really exist. And I want to tell you something. If you're living with somebody that is making you question whether or not God is real or his doctrine is is real, you better leave there as fast as you can because you'll die with them. But God's saying, hear me. Hear my voice. I love you more today than I've ever loved you a day in your life. I gave my life for you. I I wanted sinners to know you're the reason I'm here. That's why I ate with them. That's why I walked with them. No sinner guy ever touched his mouth. And Hollywood, oh, I I wouldn't want to be the guy in Hollywood that made Jesus a sinner. No guy or, or, or sin was ever in his mouth. He was a holy, spotless lamb. No sin, no guile. He ate with sinners, but he did not partake of their sin. He got close to sinners. He allowed sinners to come to him. He allowed adulterous women to come at his feet. He allowed those that were lost to come into his presence, but he never was a partaker of their sin and their ungodliness. And the writer of Hebrews said, therefore... We, we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But as God was tempted, he was tempted in all manner such as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace 
come boldly and find your place in grace. Find your place in the mercy of God. Find your place in the kingdom of God. I wouldn't let any demonic spirit keep me from getting in his presence today. I wouldn't let any lying tongue keep me from the presence of almighty God. I wouldn't let any self guilt or any condemnation keep me from the presence of God. Somebody ought to start saying preach preacher. I'm coming to Jesus. Preach preacher. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm coming. I'm going to find my place. I'm coming home. I'm going to get in that place that you desire for me to be. And he said, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. He said, when I start loving you, I'll never stop. When I start leading you, I'll never stop. When I reach for you and go into covenant with you, it will be for eternity. I will love you forever. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to keep to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it taketh hold of my covenant. Even them, even them. Folks, I am preaching to some of us that were them, strangers. No ability, certainly couldn't produce anything spiritually. No seed of righteousness in us at all. Lost and ungodly. And mercy gave us a place. I've been asked of late to write a story that is going into books about Jesse and Bessie Pugh. Brother J.T. Pugh was one of the most gifted orators, the most intelligent preachers of his kind. His wife, because he was such a powerful man, people really didn't know how powerful of a woman he was married to. And I was just a child, a new convert, had just received the Holy Ghost in Louisiana, and shortly after was in Odessa, Texas. And J.T. Pugh was my pastor. And I was 15 when I received the Holy Ghost, so I was just a teenager, 16. She was an older woman that loved souls with everything in her heart. And she came up, she saw me weeping one day at the altar and came in and got behind me and literally pulled me into her arms and begin to pray. And she said, son, I know where you live and I know the faith that it takes for you to be a part of our church. And she said, I wanna make a commitment to you that I know your mother's not living for God, but I will do everything in my power to show her the love of God as long as you are here. And my mother yesterday, I said, Mom, I want you to write the blue ashtray story. That this godly woman who did not advocate smoking or drinking or cussing would take time to love a sinner like you. And she said, Ive, I would love to spend time with you. And so she made that commitment to me in my ear. And then the next weeks and months, every time there was peanut brittle making or something was going on at the church, Sister Pugh would call my mother and said, Iva, honey, I love you. And I want you to know I'd 
love for you to come and be with our ladies and help make peanut brittle. Sister Pugh went and bought an ashtray because she knew that my mother had an addiction to smoke. She knew that my mother had been at the church for a while. My mom said it wasn't bad enough that she had already asked me to smoke in her presence and I didn't want to. She said, I, Sister Pew, I could never do that in your presence. She said, I'm just a woman. You, you can if you need to. And then it became ours, and they were at the church, and, and she came to my mom and said, Iva, honey, I know you have an addiction, and you've been here a long time. You can step outside of the church here. It's in the parking lot. You're welcome to smoke if you need to. My mother began to tremble and shake, and she said, Sister Pew, I can't smoke in your presence. You're such a godly woman. You're such a loving woman. You're so powerful, and I, I can't do that. She was in her home one day, and they were out on the patio, and Sister Pew came with that blue ashtray and said, It's been a long time. You You have an addiction. And she took a woman who was a sinner, completely disconnected from God. After she would receive the Holy Ghost 10 years later, she would make this statement, I don't even know if I'd ever had the Holy Ghost as a teenager. She said, but there was one thing I could not get away from. And it haunted me every time I drank. Every time alcohol would put me in a subconscious state, I would see that blue ashtray. And I would hear the voice of the Lord saying, Ive, if you're lost, it'll be because you would not the love of my people and my servants. He was trying to forever make a place. We're returning now as a family to give honor to the precious lady who had the character of Jesus that wanted to let my mother know that Jesus came to give sinners just like you a place. Not to make you feel awkward, not to make you feel unclean, not to make you feel cheap and undone. But he wants you to know he's got a place for you. I was out in the audience when they began to tell at the double funeral because Sister Pew, after Brother Pew had died, within just a few short hours, she said, and she was dealing with Parkinson's, I believe. And, and so she, they said, I want to go buy a dress. Well, why do you want to go buy a dress? She said, because I'm, I'm going to be with JT. And that evening she died with her new dress. I'm talking about godly people. People that not only lived what they preached They loved sinners just like Jesus and they gave them a place and they gave them an opportunity. And Sister Pew and Brother Pew were in the process of resigning and giving to the the church over to the leadership of Terry and Pam. And God moved upon me on the evangelistic field one day to call Sister Pew and to tell her the stories that my mother had related She said, Nathan, you always prayed and you fasted, and I know it. She said, but Sister Pew made me feel that Jesus still had a place for me. That he still loved me. That he still cared. My mother assumed her position. She took the place and began to pray for my stepdad, who literally was at Metairie Clinic. He saw people have to be strapped down because of their alcohol addiction. And it was only a few short months later, my mother was shocked by the fact that my stepfather wanted to go to church with her. When Brian Kinsey, a great evangelist, one of the greatest preachers in our organization, when he gave the altar call, my stepfather hit my mother and said, let's go. She said, oh, are you ready? Said, yes. But when my mom turned to go to the back door, he turned to go to the altar. 
and God filled him with the Holy Ghost because when he gave my mother a place, he gave everything attached to her a place. And there are people that are going to be rejoined to him today. And it's going to give your family hope. It's going to give your father hope. It's going to give your mother hope. It's going to give your sisters hope. It's going to give your brother hope. It's going to be a future hope for your children and your grandchildren. And he said, I'm going to make you joyful in the house a prayer. It's not going to be a drudgery. It's not going to be hard. And and I I hope I don't have the ability to do it. But if you have lost your joy and you have lost the enthusiasm of your relationship with him, he's going to offer you a place today. It will start at this church, but it will continue at your home tonight. He will be waiting on you on Monday and waiting for you on Tuesday. And he'll be waiting for you on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. He wants to make you joyful in his house of prayer. Jesus walked into a synagogue. He walked into a temple. And he said, there's something wrong with this. The money changers, doves, exchanging money. He said, you have turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. This is to be a house of prayer for my people. It's to be a joyful place where they can come and petition me and I will hear them. Where they will come and express their heart to me and I will hear them and I will obey them. And there are people under the sound of my voice that have been disconnected from the house of prayer. Disconnected from the presence of Almighty God. And today, it's not just a physical house but it's a spiritual house. And God is saying, when you open your mouth, I will hear you. And when you offer yourself as a sacrifice, I will receive you. Anything you offer to me, I will receive it today. What is so extremely important is that while God is saying, come, you are hearing his invitation every head bowed and every eye closed in this building today. Joyful in the house of prayer. I want to hear you. I want to hold you. I want to mend you. I want to touch you. If you are here today and you're in a disconnected state, He wants to make you happy again in his house of prayer. He not only has made you a place, but he has prophetically promised that when you open your mouth, I will hear you. I think the reason why a lot of backsliders don't come back to church is because they don't know what he'll say. But Jesus made it very clear through the teaching of the prodigal son I saw when you left and I'll be watching when you return. And the only way I'll go from a walk to a run is when my eyes lay hold on you and I see you again because son, I couldn't keep you from leaving, but I'll do everything I can to keep you from ever leaving again. I'm going to love you again. I'm going to hold you again. I'm going to touch you again. No mistake you have made has removed you from being my son and my daughter. I have a place for you. Kill the fatted calf. Bring the best robe. Put a ring on their finger. But the elder brother said, why is he who left his place getting a party? And you never killed me a calf. 
not just a cap, but the cap, meaning that he was preparing for a celebratory season. And he said, when my son comes back or my daughter comes back and finds their rightful place. He left with shoes, but it wasn't long until he was barefooted and only slaves were barefooted. That's why Jesus said that the father said, bring some shoes and let's get them on his feet because he's not a slave. He's still a son because mercy still has him a place. For every sinner, for every stranger, for everyone that is disconnected from God, We're not trying to yell you into a conversion. It really don't work. I'm not trying to scare you into a conversion. I'm trying to let Jesus love you into your rightful place. He loves you more today than he has ever loved you in your life. He cares about you. He died for you. And he will back the critics up and minister to your every need because he loves you. Would you stand with me all over this building? Joyful in the house, a prayer. The prayers and the prayers that you have prayed, they are done now. In Jesus' name. Feel after him just a moment. The prayers that you have prayed are done now. They are answered now. Lord, will you help me? Lord, will you heal me? Lord, will you receive me? Lord, do you still love me? Do you still care? Do you know where I'm at? Do you know how bad I hurt? The prayers that you have prayed, He is answering now. My house shall be called the house of prayer when you get back to your rightful place you open your mouth you give a sacrifice of praise you give a prayer he said I'm going to hear you and you will know that we are in covenant because I will respond to you I will make you forever joyful in my house of prayer It was in this very text in Matthew 21 and 13, and he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it the den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them because he ran the money changers out of the temple. And he said, this is not what the temple was made for. And the minute he got the money changers out of the way, the blind and the lame could come and find their place. The broken, the wounded could come in the house of God and find. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them in the house a prayer. He made them whole in the house a prayer. Would you what would you that I do unto you? Would you heal my eyes? Would you heal the brokenness of my body and spirit? Healed. Completely healed. 
in the house a prayer. The blind man went home joyful because he could see. The lame man went home joyful because he could walk. I have a word for you. You're going to see again. You're going to walk again. You're going to leap again. You're going to have real joy and peace again. It's all been fake. It's all been made up. You've smiled, but you're not happy. There's no real joy. You're broken on the inside. But the Lord said today, I'm going to make you joyful in my house. A prayer. Every head bowed one more time. Every eye closed. Jesus answered and said in that same chapter, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. In a moment, they're going to sing a song. And the Spirit of the Lord has been here in the first service saying, come unto me. And here in the second service, the Lord saying the same thing. I'm going to make you joyful in my house of prayer. When you open your mouth, I will hear you. I hear you right now. I know where you're at. And mercy is granting to you a place. Let spiritual healing happen. Let it happen. Let a 
shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Oh God, heal backslidden condition. Let us become joyful in the house of prayer. You died for sinners. You died for the ungodly. You died for my family to have a place. I'm coming to bow my knee. I'm coming to let you write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not good, but you are. I'm not holy, but you are. I'm not righteous, but you are. You're merciful. You're merciful. 